Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is um, Mr. Roll uh, coming to you here from my home office. It is week number four, day number three, and boy, could I ever use a haircut. Anyway, um, we are doing something a little bit different today. Uh, as a team, we all felt kind of bad. Normally, every morning when we do the announcements, we like to celebrate people who have birthdays. And so we realized we'd never got a chance to celebrate anybody who had a birthday in March. And so today, a couple of our team members uh, got together and they put together just a quick little video to celebrate people's birthdays in March. And so we're going to be watching that video here and then uh, coming back to me for the pledge and joke. So let's go ahead and cut over to that video of the team. It's just something they put together. Sorry, I know it's a little bit awkward and it might be a little bit quiet uh, because it's just something special that they wanted to do and they didn't really get a chance to practice and everybody has to stay far away from each other because of social distancing and all that good stuff. But let's go ahead and cut over to them for the birthday announcements. Hi, I'm Miss Nikki, and I wanted to celebrate the March birthdays with you guys since we miss you. The first birthday is Miles in first grade. The second is Mariana in third grade. Then Archer in fourth grade. Zayla in first grade. And Eva in third grade. You ready? Let's do it. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear students. Happy birthday to you. All right. So thank you guys again for putting that together for our kiddos. And we want to wish everybody in March who we missed happy birthday. Um, all right, so uh, since it's just me here, our joke of the day is kind of silly. It's, uh, what did one dinner plate say to the other plate? He said, dinner's on me, because they're plates. Get it? And the dinner is on top of them. All right, anyway, let's get over to our pledge and joke, okay? So if you are uh, with me here, let's go ahead and stand and put your right hand over your heart and say the Pledge of Allegiance with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Uh, for saying that with me and thank you for paying attention to our announcements and doing this online class with us every day. Uh, let's go ahead and cut over to your teachers for today's lesson. Have a great day. All right, so everybody, as you just saw from the morning pledge and joke, which I had to do today, um, uh, it is week four, day number three, and let's go over the agenda for the day. Uh, so first up in life skills, we're going to continue uh, talking about homes. Uh, today we're talking about credit scores and down payments. Uh, in social studies, we are uh, talking about current events and why this recession might have a slower recovery than other ones before it. Yesterday we talked about why it might be faster. Uh, in history, it's going to be a very short video because you're going to be mostly watching the videos on Khan Academy, okay? Uh, in literature, we are uh, taking a look at uh, chapter three that you read yesterday, and tonight's homework is chapter four. In science, we're just reading two pages, and then you're watching a video, again, from Khan Academy about uh, uh, Pascal's um, uh, laws of fluid pressure. We're watching the first part of a video. There's two videos in total. Uh, and then for group one, we're talking about the uh, volume of prisms. Uh, we are on uh, day two of this lesson. And uh, group number two, we are also on day two of your lesson about solving systems of inequalities. Okay, uh, so that's it for today. And uh, let's go ahead and jump into our life skills video. All right, welcome back to Life Skills. Uh, we are on week four, day three. 
Yesterday we were talking about why to buy a house uh, rather than rent and the importance of buying a house uh, uh, and how that helps you accumulate money rather than renting. Okay, and so just as a quick review, okay, if we're renting, uh, we pay, let's say we pay $1,000 a month, so that's $12,000 a year, and at the end, excuse me, at the end of the year, um, you have $0, okay? So you just pay $12,000 to rent an apartment or a house for a year, and at the end of the year, $0, okay? $0 for you. All that money went to the landlord who owns the, the, the property, okay? Now, if you're buying, though, okay, if you're buying, you spend $12,000 on your mortgage payment, and at the end of the year, you have $8,000 or more, that it ends up, that's yours, okay? That's money that, um, that, that now belongs to you in the form of what we call equity, okay? $8,000 for you, and it is in equity. In equity. Okay? Now remember, equity is the portion of the home that you own. That's not owned by the bank, it's owned by you. Okay? And so um, a home is almost like a piggy bank. And so the more you pay off the home, the more money that is in that little piggy bank. And one day when you completely pay off the mortgage, that home is yours and you don't have to pay anything else. And one day when you sell it, you get all that money. And so again, you can pay rent and never see that money again, or you can pay a mortgage and slowly begin to collect that money for your family, okay? And so that's why buying a house is not a bad idea, okay? Um, buying a house can be very troublesome. I know, I know some people in my life actually always rent because they don't want to fix things. They don't like to fix the air conditioner when it breaks. They don't like to fix the plumbing when it breaks because that can be expensive. And so I'm keeping it very simple, but there are some drawbacks of owning your own home. And I have experienced most of those drawbacks, having a leak in the roof or, or plumbing that bursts or something like that. It can be, it can be a pain. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you have a choice whether to, to own uh, with a mortgage or rent, um, it makes more financial sense usually to own. Okay? All right, so we're going to go over two more vocabulary words today. Um, that will help you in the process of buying a house, okay? So the first vocabulary that we're going to discuss today. So really quick, our vocab from yesterday, we had the word mortgage, okay? And then we had the word equity, okay? And mortgage is a home loan, and equity is the percentage of the home that you own that, that the bank no longer owns, okay? And so today, um, our vocabulary is going to be, our first vocabulary is credit score. Okay. A credit score is a score, whoops, a score that shows how responsible you are. A score that shows how responsible you are that can help a bank feel, whoops, uh, I can't write. <laughs> feel good about lending you money. Okay, so a credit score is a, a, a score that shows how responsible you are that can help a bank feel good about lending you money. So when you go to the bank, you can't just be like, hello, bank, give me some money. It doesn't work like that, okay? You have to go into the bank, you fill out an application, they check your credit score, and they want to see that you're making money, okay? So you have to be making money, you have to have a job, okay? And then you have to have a good credit score. And if you have a job and you have a good credit score, okay, then they are much, much more likely to lend you money. And so you might be asking yourself, well, what is a good credit score? Okay, typically when we're looking at a credit score, to have a decent credit score, we're looking at something that's above 700. Okay, so uh, a decent credit score, um, 
a, a decent credit score is usually 700 plus, okay? A great credit score would be 800 or more, okay? And so if you have perfect credit, you're probably close to 900, okay? If you have not so great credit, maybe your credit's around five or 600, um, but, but you want to have a credit score that's over 700. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, how do I get a credit score and how do I make sure that credit score is good? Well, when you get old enough to apply for a credit card, you can apply for a credit card and you get your first credit card and that establishes a credit score. Now, credit cards can be extremely dangerous, but if you want to start creating credit at a young age, like I did, I think when I was 18, the trick is to get a credit card with a really low limit. So you get a credit card that maybe gives you like $200 or $400 and make sure that at the end of every month you use that credit card maybe to buy lunch every day. But at the end of the month, that credit card has been completely paid off and you pay the credit card off every single month. And that can help you establish your credit score at a young age. Okay. Um, other things that help you get a credit score that's higher, if you get that first credit card and you establish a small credit score, if you get a, a loan for a car, maybe you buy a used car for three or four thousand dollars and you make regular payments on that car, that also helps you get a credit score that's higher. Okay, And so, so a credit score is, again, a score that helps a bank feel good about lending you money. Okay. All right, next up. The next word for our vocabulary is down payment. A down payment. And a down payment is the amount of money, the amount of money you pay up front when you buy something. Okay, the amount of money you pay up front when you buy something. So um, usually your down payment for your first home, okay, in the United States of America, we're really lucky because we have something called the FHA. And um, the FHA, I forget what it stands for, but FHA uh, mortgages, okay, an FHA mortgage, an FHA mortgage usually needs a down payment of 10%, okay? So an FHA mortgage is for your very first home. This is your first home, and you can only use it for your first home. And it's something the government does in the United States of America to help you buy your first home. And so if you get approved for an FHA mortgage, okay, you need to have a down payment of 10%, okay? For example, let's say you wanted to buy a house. The house is $100,000, okay? Your down payment, your down payment would need to be $10,000, okay? And so then your mortgage, your mortgage would then be for $90,000. Okay, so the house costs a hundred thousand. Your down payment is ten thousand, and so the money that you're actually borrowing from the bank to buy the house would then be ninety thousand dollars. Okay, so the down payment is the money that you pay up front towards the cost of the house. Okay, actually, a down payment can be for anything. If you're if you're buying a car with credit, a down payment can be the money you pay up front on the car. Okay, but a down payment is the money that you pay up front for the item, or in this case, for the house, okay? So for your very first home in the United States, the government has this FHA program, so you only have to t pay 10% for your down payment. So before you can buy a house, you have to save enough money for that down payment. Again, if you wanna buy that apartment or that condo or that house for $100,000, you need to make sure that you've already saved $10,000 to make that down payment, okay? So uh, that's a, an FHA mortgage. Now, if we have a normal mortgage, okay, uh, another word for normal mortgage is conventional, okay? Conventional, that's the fancy word for it. So for a conventional mortgage, okay, the down payment needs to be usually around 25%, okay? 
So for your first home, you can get in with a down payment of 10%, and then after that, it's usually 20 to 25%, okay? And so again, the government helps you out on the first one, but after that, it's up to you, okay? So using the same house as an example, so example, if the house is 100,000, okay? Then your down payment with a conventional or normal mortgage would need to be $25,000, okay? So think about it, all right? A down payment of $25,000 would take a lot longer to save up than a down payment of $10,000. It's more than twice as long to save that much money, okay? And that's why the FHA mortgage is for the first house. It helps you establish that first home. When you buy your second or third home later on, as, you, as your family grows or as you move or whatever, right, you already have equity saved in that first home. So you sell the first home, and then you get a bunch of money back into your bank account that allows you to pay the mortgage on your second and third home. So the FHA mortgage that gets you started is a way for you as a young person, once you're maybe 18, 19, actually somewhere between probably 20 and 25, to, to try to get that first home. Now, if you have a parent or guardian that's never bought a home before, it doesn't matter how old they are. Your grandparents can be in their 90s if they never owned their own home, they can get an FHA mortgage at right there that 10% level, okay? Uh, so age doesn't matter, but again, the FHA program is designed to help young people get a good start, okay? So anyway, under this conventional mortgage, the house is still $100,000, the down payment is $25,000, and then your actual mortgage would be $75,000, okay? All right, so, that's what a down payment is. It's the amount of money that you pay in the beginning. So today, our new vocabulary words were down payment and credit score, okay? And our other vocabulary words from yesterday were mortgage and equity, okay? So remember what those four words mean, and tomorrow we're going to learn two new uh, vocabulary words and learn a little bit more about this topic. All right, folks, uh, let's, let me change the, there we go. I like that a little better. All right, so um, for current events today, uh, yesterday we spoke about why this recession might be uh, a lot shorter than other recessions and we might have a very fast recovery. Again, the problem that we're facing today is an external problem. It's not inside the economy. The economy is doing great right now. The problem is coming from outside. Uh, and because it's coming from outside, as soon as this problem is over from the outside, you know, we, we, might, we might go back to normal very quickly, okay? And so this recession might be over very fast, and, and we all hope it is. So today we want to take a minute and talk about the other side. What are some things that might cause this recession to carry on for a long time, okay? Um... So in order to kind of figure out what's going on, we have to have the historical background, okay? In the year 1918, um, during World War I, we suffered from something called the Spanish flu, okay? Now the Spanish flu, uh, as, 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 as far as I know, it was also a coronavirus, okay? So the coronavirus that we're dealing with now is COVID-19, okay? The Spanish flu was another kind of coronavirus, and that was much, much worse than the coronavirus we're dealing with today. Uh, the Spanish flu um, caused death in a very high percentage of people. Something like 20% like of people who got it died within like two or three days. Um, and the Spanish flu killed you, again, very, very quickly. Uh, coronavirus today, COVID-19, is killing people in alarming numbers, and it, it's terrible. But the Spanish flu was much worse. Um, without getting too graphic, it was it was almost like something out of a horror movie. Okay, um, I will. Um, you know, I don't know if I want to do that or not. Ah, shoot. Um, I, I might put a link in 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 the thing for um, for a, a podcast that talks about the Spanish flu. But again, it was it was real bad. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, the Spanish flu came through, but the thing that we can learn from the Spanish flu about today 
is not that it was much worse with the Spanish flu. Oh, by the way, the Spanish flu didn't start in Spain. The Spanish flu, we don't know exactly where it started. It, it, it could have even started here in America. Um, but we call it the Spanish flu because everybody around the world during World War I kept it a secret. So the Spanish flu came through and it wiped out large portions of the population. As much as 10 to, to, to 20 percent of the world's population died from Spanish flu. But all the countries around the world who were engaged in World War I kept it a secret because they didn't want their enemies knowing how badly they were being hurt. The only country who was accurately reporting numbers on the Spanish flu was Spain. And so people uh, in normal everyday people like you and me who are reading about it in the paper, they're only reading about the havoc that's happening in Spain because everyone else is, is trying to keep it a secret. And so that's how it got the name Spanish flu. Okay. Uh, anyway, so um, the thing about the Spanish flu, though, even though it was much faster than COVID-19, it came in three distinct waves. The first wave of Spanish flu, uh, many considered to be the worst because it took out the most people. And then the second and third waves were also very bad, but not as bad, okay? And so that, that, that leads us to today. So right now, um, with COVID-19, we are flattening this curve by staying at home. And that's a good thing. We need to be doing that. But the recovery might be a slow one because we might need to continue socially isolating for maybe as much as a year to two years in order to uh, avoid having any really, really large resurgence of COVID-19. So it's not, um, we all hope that that's not true, okay? We all hope that that's not the case, okay? But it's very, very likely that for the next six to 12 months, restaurants and, and, and bars and places where people go to meet like churches and movie theaters, will have to practice social distancing for some time to come. And so if you're a restaurant, or even if you are a store, like a retail store, and you are not allowed to have people standing next to each other in your store or your place of business, you're not gonna make as much money, right? And so because of the social distancing that we might need uh, uh, to have, in order to continue fighting COVID-19 after this first big wave washes over us, this social distancing that we need to continue having for the next year or two might make our recession last a much longer time than it would otherwise, okay? And so um, more than likely, the recession will be over quickly because COVID-19 will come and go, okay? But there is a slight possibility that we are going to experience COVID-19 in a similar way that they experienced the Spanish flu more than 100 years ago. Um, and it might come in in several waves. And if it does, that will have much, a much greater impact on the overall economy of the United States and of the world. Okay. And so, again, it's not likely that that's going to happen. It's more likely that the first one from yesterday is going to happen, and we'll get over this quickly. But it is important to talk about worst-case scenarios since we're all doing school at home already. You know, we already have kind of a worst-case scenario going on right now. All right, that's it for my doom and gloom for current events. It's time to move on to history. All right, for today's history, I am not going to be teaching a lesson. Um, I want you to watch, uh, there's actually several videos. Uh, you're going to be learning about something called social Darwinism. Um, it's not super nice, okay? It's actually like super racist. We talked in class about this pervasive racism that went on, and it was a worldwide global phenomenon, and it was supposedly backed up by science back then, okay? It wasn't really, but people misinterpreted it back then. Um, and so we're gonna be learning about social uh, uh, Darwinism today, and we're gonna be seeing an interview about the Gilded Age. Uh, something that I really like about this interview is that you actually get to see what Sal Khan looks like. And so when you're going through Khan Academy, you hear uh, Mr. Khan give a lot of uh, lectures and talks and stuff, but you don't actually get to see him. Uh, in this CBS interview or in this interview with a CBS presenter, you actually get to see what Sal Khan looks like. And so it's kind of cool to put a face to the name. 
Okay, so today you're watching the interview on the Gilded Age uh, with Sal Khan that he conducts, and then you're going to be watching two videos about social Darwinism uh, from a biologist and a, a historical specialist, okay? And so I'm not going to say anything more. Just go ahead and go watch those videos uh, uh, for your homework. All right, are we recording? Uh, I think we are. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is week four, day three, and last night you were supposed to read uh, chapter three as your homework. Uh, and so in chapter three, um, it, it's not one of my favorite chapters by far, but it is kind of silly and it kind of it kind of captures that um, that 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 part of us where where when we're young. Our, our feelings are easily changed from day to day. And so he has this girl he has this big crush on, uh, but then he sees this other girl and suddenly he doesn't care about the first girl. He's only in love with the second girl. And so he is, he's like doing tricks outside of her, uh, outside of her house. He's doing little gymnastics tricks to try to get her attention. And all he can think about is her. And then later on that day, uh, he gets in trouble because his brother Sid uh, tries to steal like a bowl of sugar and he, he, he gets caught, he breaks it. And so when, when his aunt comes home, she immediately thinks it's Tom because Tom's the naughty one. She starts beating him, you know, and, uh, uh, and then it, it turns out that it was actually Sid's fault and the aunt finds out, but she's like, well, you know, you deserved it anyway. So whatever. And so, and secretly, you know, the aunt kind of feels bad for beating him and he knows that she feels bad, but, uh, but, but she won't say sorry. And so it sends him into this whole pity spiral. And I remember being a kid kind of having these pity spirals like that, where it's like, Oh, life is so unfair, blah, blah, blah. And in a reoccurring theme that happens over and over in this book, uh, he, he like imagines his own death. Like, um, I don't know if you've seen the the the, the movie, uh, what is it, A Christmas Story, uh, with the little boy who wants to get the BB gun, but it, it's that exact same thing. And I think that most, at least most little boys, I think, go through this, where uh, they, they, they imagine, well, you know, you'll be sorry if I ever died, that'd be so sad. And so in, in, the, in, in the Christmas story, the little boy, he goes blind and... and and he imagines how his parents will be so sad if he went blind. They're like, oh, we treated you bad. And so kind of in a similar way, uh, Huckleberry, I'm sorry, Tom Sawyer is imagining, you know, what it would be like if he died and, and how people would be so sad at his funeral. And, 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 and he's just like throwing a pity party for himself so much that he even starts crying. And he's like, oh, oh, oh. Uh, and so I thought that was kind of cute. And I know for me, even though this book is over 100 years old, it really captures some of the elements like of my own childhood. I don't know if, if you've ever experienced any of these things yourself, but I, I just think it, it, this whole story is super, super fun. And, uh, kind of reminiscent of, of what it's like to be a kid, um, even if even if we didn't grow up in that same time period, okay? So anyway, your homework for tonight is to read chapter four, and we'll talk about it a little bit tomorrow. And again, under the words to know, you need to be writing out the words to know with the definition that's listed in the PDF file. So write out the definition by hand, write it five times each by hand, take a photo of it, send it into Mr. Barbero so he can give you the literature credit and uh, read through the chapter, okay? All right, thanks everybody. Uh, this is uh, week number four, day number three for science. So today we're going to be reading a couple pages out of the book, and then we are going to be watching uh, uh, the first video on uh, Pascal's theory uh, on the Khan Academy website. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So right here, figure eight, uh, a liquid completely filling a bottle exerts pressure excuse me, in all directions, okay? And so you see all these little like red arrows here. Uh, it's, it's, it's pushing pressure against all sides of the bottle, okay? When the stoppers push further into the bottle, so the cork or the rubber stoppers kind of pushed in furthermore, okay, the pressure increases. So the bottle is, is stressed and there's more pressure inside the bottle, okay? Basic idea. So let's start reading Pascal's Principle. As you learned in the last section, a fluid exerts pressure on any surface in contact with it. For example, the water in each bottle in figure 8 exerts pressure on the entire inside surface of the bottle, up, down, and sideways. What happens if you push the stopper down even further? 
The water has nowhere to go, so it presses harder on the inside surface of the bottle. The pressure in the water increases everywhere in the bottle. This is shown by the increased width of the arrows in, uh, on the right in figure 8. Pressure increases by the same amount throughout an enclosed or confined fluid. This fact was discovered in the 1600s by a French mathematician named uh, Blase Pascal. Pascal's name is used for the unit of pressure. When force is applied to a confined fluid, an increase in pressure is transmitted equally to all parts of the fluid. This relationship is known as Pascal's principle. Force pumps. What would happen if you increase the pressure at one end of a fluid in a container with a hole on the other end? If you have ever used a squeeze bottle or a medicine dropper, you already know what happens. Because it is not confined by the container, the fluid is pushed out of the opening. This simple example shows how a force pump works. A force pump causes a fluid to move from one place to another by increasing the pressure in the fluid. So if you're having trouble visualizing this, don't worry, it's, it's on the next page, okay? Your heart consists of two force pumps. One of them pumps blood to the lungs where it can pick up oxygen from the air you breathe. This blood, now carrying oxygen, returns to your heart, then is pumped to the rest of the body by the second pump. And here we go, here's, here's kind of this idea, okay? Uh, so figure nine, in a hydraulic device, a force applied to one piston increases the pressure in the fluid. So again, the force is being applied here on this side, and it increases the pressure on the other side. Pressure from the small piston acts over a larger area to produce a greater force. In a hydraulic car lift, this greater force is used to lift the car. Okay, so pressure is here being applied, and then over here the car goes up. Okay, so using Pascal's principle, suppose you fill the small U-shaped tube shown in figure 9a, okay, this one uh, right there on the left, uh, with water, and you push down on the piston on the left side. A piston is similar to a stopper that can slide up and down inside the tube. The increase in pressure will be transmitted to the piston on the right. What can you determine about the force exerted on the right piston? According to Pascal's principle, both pistons will experience the same fluid pressure. If both pistons have the same area, then they will also experience the same force. But what if the area is not the same? That comes next. Now suppose that the right piston has a greater area than the left piston. For example, the small piston in the U-shaped tube in figure 9b has an area of one square meter, right there. The large piston has an area of 20 square meters over here, okay, on this side, all right? If you push down on the left piston with a force of 500 newtons, the increase in pressure on the fluid is 500 newtons per meter squared. A pressure increase of 500 newtons per meter squared means that the force on every square meter of the piston surface uh, by <clears throat> increases by 500 newtons. Since the surface area on the right piston is 20 square, me uh, 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 square meters, the total increase in force on the right piston is 10,000 newtons. The push exerted on the left piston is multiplied by 20 times on the right piston. Okay, and so this is a force multiplier. Okay, the force is being multiplied so uh, uh, one unit of work over here creates 20 units of work over here. Isn't that crazy? That's really cool. Um, the total increase in force on the right piston is 10,000 newtons. The push exerted on the left piston is multiplied by 20 times on the right piston. Depending on the size of the pistons, you can multiply this force by any amount. Isn't that cool? I think that's pretty awesome. Okay, you know what? Actually, uh, even though I want to keep on going, we're going to stop there for today, and I want you to watch the first video on Khan Academy that explains this. Uh, Khan Academy gets a little bit too deep into all this stuff, and it goes over your heads because it's like high school physics, but I do think that these first two videos are very important to watch, okay? So let's go ahead and watch them. Oh, just, just watch one video for today. We'll watch the second one tomorrow. So are we recording? All right, so we are in week four.
day number three, and this is group number one. Okay, as you can see, I'm gonna try to do this holding a baby. Hey, baby. This is baby Tilly. Um, I don't know how well it's gonna work, so I might have to pause the video and put her down here. Okay, so uh, yesterday, as you saw here, uh, we were learning about cubic units. Okay, and so we had uh, units cubed, and you can kind of count the cubes and you can figure out what the volume is. Okay, like we discussed yesterday, volume is the amount of stuff that you can fit in a three-dimensional shape. And so in this cube here, this was, uh, this was our, uh, what do you call it, our fish aquarium, the volume of the fish tank is how much water you can fit in the fish tank, okay? And so uh, today we're gonna learn about uh, the volume of things that aren't just rectangular prisms. Look at she seems a little happy. I don't know. Okay, so first up, we need to go over the formulas. Because we can't just simply count the cubes here, we actually have to have a formula, okay? And so, uh, so for finding the volume of a prism, okay, the volume of a prism is the base times the, the height, okay? And so we have to get the area of the base, okay, and then multiply that by how tall or how long the prism is, okay? And so in this situation right here, we have a triangular base, okay? And we, on this triangular base, we know that this side is five inches, and then we know that the height here is gonna be six inches, okay? And so we have to remember how to find the area of a triangle. And so the area of the triangle, area equals one half times the base times the height, okay? So we take the area of the triangle is one half, times five times six. So area equals 15 because these two are 30 and 30 times one half or one half of 30 is 15, okay? And so uh, since we know that the area of this triangle right here, the area equals 15 to find the volume of the triangular prism, we then have to multiply the area times how long it is, okay? And in this picture, it tells us right there that the length is 11 inches, okay? And so since this is 11 right here, we take the area of 15 times the length of 11. Oh, are you getting upset? Oh, it's okay, little girl. Okay. I think I need to put her down and give her back to her mom here. I was just trying to be a good dad. Anyway, okay. And so we get a total volume of 165 inches cubed. Uh, sorry guys, it doesn't look like it's gonna work for too much longer. Okay, say goodbye, baby Tilly. Bye-bye. Okay, let me go put her down. Is she gonna be good? No, she's not. My mommy has babies, so we should be good to go. All right, okay, so here we are. Um, so again, the idea is we have to find the area of the base, whether the base is a triangle or a circle, and then we take that area and we just multiply it by the length of the prism, okay? Uh, again, we just found the area of the triangle here, and then we multiplied it by how long it was, and we got 165 inches cubed, okay? So for the volume of a cylinder, it's the exact same thing. Okay, uh, for the volume, we, we can get the area of the, of the circle and then multiply it by how long it is. Um, or we can, uh, we can use this, this formula right here uh, and the bottom where it's volume equals pi r squared times the height. Okay, I want to point out that pi r squared is the area right there. Okay, so right there, that is the area of the circle, pi r squared. Okay, so for a circle, area equals pi times the radius squared already, and then we just multiply that times the height and get the volume. So volume is the area times the height, okay? All right, and so for this specific one, okay, we have our circle right there and the radius, gosh, that's an ugly circle, but that's, that's okay. So the radius is three centimeters, okay? And just like you see right there, we take three centimeters and we multiply it by pi. So when we're figuring out the area, uh, we have 
3 right here, and it's squared. Okay. Uh, we get 9 times pi. Okay. And just like it says over here, down here, like right there, doo -doo -doo, that's where we're at. Okay. Uh, 3.14 times 9. So your 36, uh, be 9, 12, 27, 28. So we get uh, area equals 28.26. What is the unit? Centimeters. Centimeters squared. Okay. And then we have to multiply it by the height of the cylinder, which is 6.1. So the cylinder uh, goes back. 6.1 centimeters, okay. Boy, this is really gross looking, I'm sorry. 28 times 0.26 centimeters squared times 6.1 centimeters. Boom. Okay, we do the math. 2826. Okay, 6 times 6 is 36. So I don't need to have that decimal point. doesn't need to be there. Not yet, at least. 6 times 6 is 36, 3 up there. 6 times 2 is 12, plus 3 is 15. 6 times 8 is 48, 49, 4. 6 times 2 is 12, 16. Add them all up. 6, 8, 3, 2, 7, 1. We have three decimal places that we have to bump. So we get 172. 0.386 centimeters cubed, okay? Which is what they got right here, but then they rounded it, okay, to 172.4, okay? So, um, again, if we were to put it in steps, step one, find the area of the base, okay? Step number two, multiply. by how long the prism is. You could say how long or tall, okay? Either way, okay? And so that's how we do these kinds of problems, okay? Again, we find the area of the base, whether it's a triangle or it's a circle, and then we multiply by how long it is, okay? Um, ba -ba -ba. And that is it for today's lesson. It's time for you to go back into Khan Academy, where you're going to be getting this uh, again. It's taught to you kind of in a different way, okay? Um, and then um, I am going to be doing a review with you tomorrow over this stuff. I want to make sure that you know how to do this before we move on, okay? All right. Uh, if you have any questions, please send it to myself and Mr. Barbero uh, to our email. Thank you, folks. Have a good one. All right, let's give it a second. Sometimes if I start too early, the audio gets cut off. All right, so uh, we are doing group two, and we are on week four, day three. Okay, so yesterday you were supposed to do some review over the basics of how to do inequalities. And so yesterday in the lesson, as you can see here, we did a system of inequalities that had three different equations. Okay, and so we got this here. Uh, and the shaded in area here was the area where all three inequalities met. It's almost like one of those Venn diagrams, if you've ever seen those, and you shade in the area in between. It's just like that, okay? <clears throat> and so today, we're going to do a couple more examples, and then you're going to do a few more uh, items from Khan Academy. Now, I'm not sweating this too much because if you can do a system of equations, then you can definitely do a system of inequalities without too much trouble. So I'm actually not too worried about you guys understanding this concept. It's just a matter of getting some practice in, okay? So let's start off with a different system of inequalities. This one is a much simpler system than what we did yesterday. Just as an example, I don't know if you can hear my kids in the background. They're screaming in the bathtub, so I apologize if that distracts anybody. Um, all right, so let's do this small system. It's y is less than 4 and y is greater than 1, okay? And so this is a very simple system of equations. Or, I'm sorry, system of equations, system of inequalities, I should say. That's 
more accurate or accurate. One, two, three, four, five, six. There we go. Okay. And so for my top inequality, it's going to be y is less than four. Okay. So I find four. One, two, three, four. And I just put a dotted line here. Okay. It has to be a dotted line because it's not equal to. Perfect. And then on the bottom here, we have y is greater than one. And so I put another dotted line at the, at the one. Oh, whoops, I forgot a step. Uh, so on this one, for, uh, for y is less than four, okay, if y is less than four, then we know we have to go under the four here, okay? So the blue is here, and it's under four, okay? And on the second one here, y is greater than one, okay? We're going to know that since it's at one, but it's more, then our lines will go here, like that, okay? Now, when you do systems of inequalities, if you're doing it on your iPad, you can do it like I'm doing it right now, but if you're doing it on a piece of paper, it's really nice to be able to use like some colored pencils or something like that. And so the area where both of these inequalities meets is right in the middle here. It's the center area, okay? And so my graph, this is, this is the answer for my graph, and the center area is the region where the answers are, okay? So my answers can be anywhere here in this center region, okay? And so as you can see here, graphing a system of inequalities doesn't have to be terribly complicated. It can be a little easy, okay? Uh, let me do a system of inequalities that's a bit more complicated, uh, but it still only has two inequalities, okay? So let's do this next one here, all right? And so in this next system of inequalities, whoops, that looks kind of gross. Let's go ahead and try that again. Okay, so we have y is less than or equal to x plus 2. And then we have y is greater than or equal to negative 1 half. So we know the slope is negative x plus five. Okay, let's see. And so I'm going to graph my x and my y. Okay, and let's see here. Let's go up to, um, uh, let's go up to 10 on all sides. I think that would probably be best. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now kids, if you want to cheat on this, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and if you want to use your graphing calculator to help you, you can always do that. But you must be able to graph it normally. Like you need to be able to have the ability to graph these, like like uh, like like sit down and figure out the y equals mx plus b. So this first one, the two crosses over uh, at the y-axis. I'm sorry, the b is two, so it crosses the y-axis at two. It, there is nothing here where the m is supposed to be, so we know it's a 1 over 1 slope. So we go up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1. This is a little tedious, but we kind of have to make sure that we're doing it correctly. Whoops. Okay, back here. So my line is not going to be perfect. It's a little weird. Okay because Mr. Roll's not a perfect person, <laughs> and so it gets kind of funky, okay? But it's okay. That is certainly passable. It is a solid line because it is greater than or equal to... Oh, now I have to do a test, okay? I have to test to see whether it's this side that's colored in or, or the bottom side, okay? So I'm going to use zero, 0, as my test window or my test plot, okay? And so let's take zero, 0, and use it as my tester to see if that side is colored in or not for my inequality. Okay, hopefully you know what I mean. And then we're doing 0, 0, just like that. So we have 0 is less than or equal to 0 plus 2, okay? And then we get 0 is less than or equal to 2, and that is correct, okay? So we know that on this equation, the bottom part is the colored in part, okay? So that bottom part is going to be colored in. Hooray. 
All right, let me use red, mix it up a little bit here for this next one. So we know that uh, the B uh, for this next one is at five. So we have to count up five, one, two, three, four, five, right there. And we know that the slope is negative one half. So we're going down one over two. So go down one over two, one, two. Gonna be right about there. So the overlap here, let's see here, it looks like the overlap point is gonna be one, two, three, four. 1, 2. So it's going to be at 4, 2. So we have an overlap point at 4, 2. That's where they intersect. We go down 1 over 2, just like that. And on this side, we're going to go up 1 over 2, just like that. Okay. And it's going to be a solid line again. Down 1 over 2. Down 1 over 2. Here, give me one second. Marshall, I'm in the middle of uh, doing a lesson, buddy. You're going to have to take care of yourself for a minute. I'll be out when I'm done. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's weird working at home still. I'm still not used to it. Okay. All right. Uh, let's... Dum, 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 dum. There we go. Sorry. Again, my lines aren't very straight. Mr. Roll is definitely not perfect. Okay. So we need to find out if the coloring is on the bottom or if it's on the top. Okay, and my easy test point is always zero, zero, so I'm going to use that again because that is, again, a very easy test point. Okay, all right, we have zero, zero. Okay, total side note my wife is out there. Why don't my kids call her anyway? Do, do, do. It's okay, they like me. Or they like fighting with each other and they know that I have a higher tolerance for that. I don't know. Okay, so let's solve this. Uh, we get 0 plus 5. Okay, 0 is greater than or equal to 5. That does not work. Okay, that does not work. So, 0, 0 does not work. So it is not the bottom. It has to be the top. This top part is the colored in part. Okay? All right. And so I'm going to go ahead and let's erase this on the bottom there. Okay? All right, so the area here that is the solution for my problem is going to be this area right in here, okay? So this space between these two is the area that is the answer. Oh, sorry, guys. Let me shut the door here. Okay. Whew. Again, I apologize for all the racket in the background. Okay, so we got this. And then um, I think that's it. So for today, those are the only examples that we're doing. So again, it doesn't have to be hard. Right here, we figured out that this was the solution. Okay, in the center. Down here, we figured out that the solution was this thing right over here. Okay. And so doing these systems of inequalities, it's kind of like doing systems of equations, but uh, with coloring. Okay. And so you have uh, some, uh, some lessons to do on Khan Academy. Let me double check here. So for Khan Academy today, uh, it looks like you're going to be uh, uh, doing two exercises for graphing systems of inequalities. Um, oh, no, 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 no. For today, you're watching two videos. Sorry, I'm looking at my syllabus. Uh, you're watching two videos for graphing systems of inequalities, just basically showing you what we did here. And then tomorrow we're going to do a few more exercises, and we're going to and we're going to actually make you do the practices on Khan Academy and see if you can get them right. Okay. All right. So that's it for today. Thank you very much.